Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. <laughs> My name is Lars Nilsson. I program for AFS Cinema. And uh, we've got a wonderful cross-section of people here. We've got a number of young people who I talked to in the lobby who have never seen this before, and then a number of uh, people my age who are saying, 30 years old? This movie's 30 years old? Um, so everybody's represented here. So um, it has been a real sort of existential crisis for those of us who realize that this is a 30-year-old movie because it doesn't feel like a 30-year-old movie, but it, but it is. And it's a movie that's been a, a part of our lives for a, a long, long time. Um, and speaking of a part of our lives, so um, you, you've met our special guest tonight before at a number of AFS screenings. He's one of our favorite, well, what the hell I'll say it, he's our favorite film professor, uh, Mark Cunningham. And he's he, he's going to join us. Um, now, Mark is, his, is writing a book. In fact, I have some galley proofs of, uh, of uh, one chapter of his book that I was reading earlier today, which I'll, I'll sell it for 20 bucks if anybody wants it. Um, but um, he's writing a book about John Singleton. And uh, we had talked, hell, at this point, it's been years ago, about coming in and doing an event around the films of John Singleton and showing um, maybe a triple feature, let's say, or a three-part series. Um, and then John Singleton died a couple of years ago. Um, and then it, uh, we realized that the 30th anniversary of this was happening. And then uh, serendipitously, there was also a 35 millimeter print still available in the vaults, which is becoming less and less of an, uh, a thing that you find anymore. Um, so we figured, let's, let's just, let's do this now. And then when the book comes out, we'll do it again. Uh, and we'll, we'll show the other films too. So all I'm gonna need from you guys is a promise that you'll come back and watch it again when we show it again, all right? <laughs> all right, thank you. But for, the, for right now, I, I just wanted to, we're so lucky to be back to be able to have these kinds of events, uh, to have the cinema open again. And I feel so lucky and happy that we have our friend Mark Cunningham here, and he's going to come up and say a couple of words before we watch the film. After the show, he's going to come back up and we're going to have a discussion, but for the time being, Mark, uh, introduce the film, please. That's nice. You said favorite professor. <laughs> That's cool, I love it. Well, man, thanks everybody uh, for coming out uh, to watch Boys in the Hood. Uh, this movie, uh, everybody that knows me knows how much this movie means to me and how much John Singleton means to me. And as Lars mentioned, him dying a couple years ago, it hit me really, really hard. And you know, this book that I'm writing, which really kind of focuses on uh, the movie, the three movies that make up what he once called his Hood Trilogy. So as you know, uh, John Singleton is from South Central Los Angeles, born and bred in South Central LA. And so he, you know, Boys in, Boys in the Hood, and well, actually him wanting to become a filmmaker kind of came out of this desire to make movies about his neighborhood. Uh, much like Spike Lee did for New York, much like Martin Scorsese does for New York. And he wanted to do something similar. And so ends up making Boys in the Hood, and then, you know, a couple years later would make Poetic Justice with the great Janet Jackson. Uh, everybody knows me knows about me and Janet Jackson, too. So uh, <laughs> uh, I'm just waiting for her to come and take me away from all of this. Um, and then <laughs> he would make, it, uh, be, it'd be a while, and then in 2010, he would make uh, Baby Boy with Tyrese, Taraji P. Henson, and uh, Snoop Dogg. And so unfortunately, those are the only three movies he got to make about his neighborhood. He would see him, you would, we would see John Singleton because, uh, you know, again, it is so interesting now that he's died to hear everybody talk about what a great filmmaker he was because that's not what people were saying when he was alive. Uh, Boys in the Hood is largely considered the high water mark of his career. In fact, that's what Michael Eric Dyson said about the film. And so, you know, you're coming out of the gate and people are saying that about your movie, your first film. You know, how do you, uh, you know, how do you fight back from that? How do you, you know, how do you top that? And you know, also not only that becoming the youngest person, still holds the record be, uh, for the youngest person ever be nominated for the best director Oscar. Um, you know, at 24 years old, a record that was once held by Orson Welles for Citizen Kane at 26. And Orson Welles held that record from 41 to Singleton in 91, uh, 92 actually is when the Oscars hopped that year. So, I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's really, 
you know, kind of funny to see that him to kind of start out that way and then get to a position where his last movie ends up being the movie Abduction with Ty uh, Taylor Lautner. Uh, <laughs> Which, I mean, you know, and, and, you know, and got some terrible reviews or whatever, and he just really couldn't regain that footing, right? There was, like, the interest in the films that he was making or what he wanted to do. Uh, and, it, you know, he went to television and told South Central Los Angeles stories there, most famously uh, when he died when he was doing Snowfall, which is about how, the, how crack was pushed into uh, urban neighborhoods like South Central Los Angeles, uh, not only... Uh, with the hand of the cartel and the people who lived in those neighborhoods, but the CIA as well. So if you're familiar with Gary Webb and uh, Jeremy Renner's movie, Kill the Messenger, you kind of know like where that comes from. But all of that to say, Boys in the Hood is a special film. I know sometimes it gets tagged as a hood movie, but it's really this beautiful coming of age film about what it means to be young and grow up in a milieu like, uh, like South Central Los Angeles, a place right where uh, the odds sometimes are against you and, and you know, it, it is kind of you know, hard to fight out of that, but then you, know, you do what you can to make it out. Uh, get, if you haven't seen it before, uh, I always run into students who haven't seen it. Uh, and run into people who haven't seen it. I hope you have napkins and tissues with you, I'll say that. Uh, because it's just such a touching story, and it, this, this movie just means the world to me, and I'm just happy to be here with you and to be able to talk about it. So thank you all for having me. I appreciate you. Thanks so much. There we go. All right. Wow. So how many times have you seen that? Oh, my God. I've seen Boys in the Hood probably, oh man, since 91? Yeah. <sighs> probably 50 times, maybe? I could recite it word for word. You, yeah, no, I, I, have, I have movies <laughs> like that. Yeah, yeah. So when you've seen a movie that many times, I, I notice when I watch a movie I've watched a lot, I, I get something, I see something new every time. Mm -hmm. This time, what did you see that was new? No, you, I, you, I, know you know it, I, I know it. I know it. I know it backwards and forwards. I mean, and when you know, I mean, my book it comes from my dissertation. Mm -hmm. So I wrote my dissertation on John Singleton, and so I mean, I've spent a lot of years with poetic justice and Baby Boy in this movie. So in John Singleton, so. And, yeah. and, and, and so you saw when it came out in '91. You saw it then. I did. I saw it in the theater and boo hooed, uh -huh. and I, and my friends. Uh, Latrice and, and Nicole, or who took me to see it back home in Dallas. I'm from Dallas, Oak Cliff mm -hmm. in Dallas. And um, they made fun of me. They were like, he can't handle it. He can't handle it. You know. but, uh, but I was just moved. Yep. I was I mean, incredibly moved by it. And you know, I come from, I mean, uh, you know, this movie is semi-autobiographical, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, John Singleton was raised by his mom for a little bit, and then she sent him to live with his dad. Um, and I was John Singleton. I'm an only child, mm -hmm. like John Singleton's an only child. Uh, and you know, my, well, my mom didn't send me. To, I didn't have much of a relationship with my dad, uh, but my mother and my mother was uh, my mother was Furious Styles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my mother just died uh, like two years in December, mm -hmm. and um, she, she was Furious Styles. So I related to this movie. I mean, completely. I come from a neighborhood, uh, you know close to this, kind of like this. And so, I mean, it was just, I couldn't believe somebody was telling something that I knew on screen like that. So, so when Furious Style speaks, particularly when he's in front of the soul to soul billboard out there, yeah, uh -huh. to, to what extent do you think that that's, that's, he's certainly the moral center of the film, I think, but to, to what extent do you think that that's Singleton's philosophy, that that really is it. Yeah, I mean, you know, Singleton's work, I mean, is born out of this kind of, you know, organic black thought, right, a kind of black mm -hmm. nationalist thought. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there are books, I mean, you know, Boys in the, uh, excuse me, uh, Baby Boy is, you know, has its foundation in Dr. Francis Cress Wilson's book, The ISIS Papers. And uh, and so, you know, that kind of, you know, Juwanza Kanjufu and, 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 you know, that kind of, you know, Conspiracy to Destroy Black Boys, all those kinds of books or whatever else, kind of like the foundation for this kind of thinking. And so, you know, what you hear Furious says, it's almost like the Sermon on the Mount is what it's called, like, you know, Moses, like, you know. Uh, and, and here he is kind of giving this information. I mean, this very true about what's happening in this neighborhood, right? That, you know, soul to soul, right? You know, you see in the back that, you know, not only is it being gentrified, you know, 
largely about, you know, this, it's not just a case of like white people coming into the neighborhood and gentrifying the area, but this is like, you know, Asian people kind of coming into these neighborhoods and, and setting up businesses and stuff like that, which is, you know, I mean, you can see that, you can see that here in Austin. I mean, it, it's, that kind of happens in these spaces where, you know, this is something, of course, you know, Spike Lee talks about and do the right thing, mm -hmm. right? That they can come, these kind of immigrants, right? That can come to these spaces and kind of build businesses in these places. And then black people who've been here their entire lives, you know, don't get bank loans, you know, and if they do get bank loans, there are these exorbitant kind of interest rates that they can't pay back. I mean, all of this stuff ends up happening and they end up kind of like on low on the totem pole. And so this is what Furious is talking about. Mm -hmm. And that scene in, in, in South Central Los Angeles is, you know, very much, you know, was not exempt from that, of course. You know, so many areas like that, that ends up happening. Um, th there's a, John Singleton's bringing a message in this movie, and, and it's interesting that, does anybody know where his cameo is in the movie? He's bringing the, he, he shows up, he's the postman who shows yeah. up in the, at a really awkward time, let's face right, it. Right, right, yeah, <laughs> definitely. And, and, and brings <laughs> and brings the message, yeah. you know. So so like it's uh, is that it seems like watching this because uh, you know I've seen it many fewer times than you have, but I've seen it a few <laughs> times. Um, the things that I notice for uh, is like the heavy symbolism of like the stop signs and the various signs, and also the uh, I never noticed before how many helicopters we hear overhead yeah. all the time. Yeah, that I mean sonically, yeah, yeah, I mean sonically, this movie is very much so kind of reminds you of what this neighborhood is like, what this environment is like. And even in that scene where you see that stop sign, uh, you know, you see the plane going mm -hmm. overhead, right, right. right? And this way, this notion of kind of like wanting to, how do you get out, right? Or how do you remove yourself from that situation, right? And, like, and so, you know, there's some criticism, you know, that was kind of leveled at the film in this notion, right? That's kind of, you know, in order to succeed, in order to make it, right? You have to do it outside of the neighborhood, right? But, you know, but in the 90s, I mean, there was this thought, right, of go, you know going to Atlanta, right? I mean, at the black mecca of sorts, right? Which you know, Atlanta is largely still kind of thought like that, thought of like that, you know. But going to Morehouse, going to Spelman, I mean, going to these, you know, kind of preeminent schools, right? You know, but you know, but Trey kind of represents in the story, right? That that one that will get out, right? And so, and this has happened to me, you know, like I said, coming from a neighborhood like that, when you're the smart one. Right, we, 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 or when you're the one that's, you know, you go to school and they know your book's smart, you read all the time, whatever, the brothers in the neighborhood take care of you. They protect you, they whoop your ass, right? They'll beat you up, they'll, you know, they're, they're toughen you up is what they're doing. But they, there are certain things they won't let you do. Like, and so like even in that scene we see uh, when they're on the way to kind of retaliate, you know, you know for Ricky's death, uh, or Ricky's murder, um, and when Trey says, let me out though, they let him out, you know, because it is, it's like saving the one, like we may not be able to get out, but you can. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's so many instances like where brothers take care of you like that in situations like that. And, and so it's just all of these things are kind of a reminder, right, of what this neighborhood is like, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. It's so funny, I grew up in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, <laughs> and uh, you, you're not gonna believe this, but I grew up in a similar neighborhood too. Uh -huh. And there was a kid who, uh, uh, there was one kid who like, played the violin and he carried his violin case around, that kid was so well protected. Mm -hmm. yeah. He was taken care of because he represented, he was gonna get out. Yeah, he's gonna get out. Yeah. I mean, and, and, they, and, and, and they understand that, they know yeah. that, right? And, and, this, and even Ricky in that regard, right, is, is, is kind of in that same boat, right? He's gonna get out, he's gonna make something of himself. Uh, but I have a theory that I, I talk about in, in, in the book about Ricky. Uh, you wanna hear it? I wanna okay. do it. <laughs> uh, my theory about Ricky is, and this may be far-fetched for some people, but I, I firmly think about these kinds of things, but I think Ricky engaged in something that would be the equivalent of suicide by cop. Uh, because you know there are instances where the, their brothers, uh, these young brothers, they kind of feel disillusioned and they, they don't know what else to do with their lives or whatever, and so they will like taunt police officers, knowing the police officers will shoot them because of that instill fear of black yeah. bodies. And so yeah. they know they'll do it. And so, and that's the way of doing it without doing it yourself, right? But I'm always concerned, I always think about Ricky in the sense that, you know, when he's talking to the recruiter from USC and all he knows is football and nobody else has asked anything else of him. And when he starts asking him specific questions about like, why do you want 
you know, what you know, why do you why you know why you want to go to school, and and what is it you want to do? And, and Ricky doesn't have any answers, and 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 we see him in those moments to kind of come disillusioned, and he you know, is thinking about going to the army or whatever. But what really makes me think this is anybody that comes from a neighborhood like that knows that there's an order to things, right? And when he makes that comment. I mean, these fools ain't gonna do nothing. He knows better than that. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. stops to pee. He's, tr you know, let's split up. He's like literally kind of lackadaisical about it. And he's, you know, still, you know, trying to find another way to get out, you know, that might not be, you know, with the lottery, not, yeah, trying, yeah, you know, yeah, going yeah. to school right, right. or whatever. And he, he, and when the guys do come and they shoot him, you know, and, and, and they kill him, they kill him uh, I, I always think about that's the way, well, now I don't have to worry about it anymore. I don't have to worry about how I'm going to take care of my kid. I don't have to worry about whether or not I make over 700 on my SATs. I don't have to worry about what if the football thing doesn't happen if I don't make it to the NFL and I'm not able to take care of my family. There's so much pressure on brothers like this, right? That this end up happening, you know, this ends up happening to him. We don't talk a whole lot about that, right? Because once these these you know these young guys, particularly these guys who are kind of athletically inclined, like Ricky, are kind of looked like looked at as like meal tickets, mm -hmm. and 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 it, and it is it's a tremendous amount of pressure, and letting those guys letting that kind of take its course and happen the way it does is a way to not have to deal with that. Yeah, that, I mean that's chilling because yeah. because his ticket he gets his ticket out. Yeah, he does. It shows, he gets that's it out. the last thing that shows up. He yeah. gets his ticket out. You know. He gets yeah. Yeah, that's that, that that's pretty. Uh, that's and there's deep. so much uncertainty, right? You know, waiting on a test score. And and you're not sure and you don't know. And when you don't know anything else about football, and, and you know, and these things are not his fault. I mean, you know, these are th you know, this is something that he was good at and he continued to be good at, but nobody else told him about any other options. Whereas here you have Trey, right, who has the benefit of that. And and the deck looks a little stacked in the film. I know it does, but I think what Singleton does, I think you know, Singleton is not in, in my opinion, is not trying to make any kind of negative commentary about single mothers or anything like that. But I think what he is doing is trying to change the narrative we have about black fathers because that has been negative so long and continues to be negative. And then here's an example, right, where you see your brother stepping up to the plate, taking care of his son, guiding him the way that he should. And, and you know, and, 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 and Furious doesn't do everything right. I mean, for somebody at the beginning who is like, you know, you need to wear rubber and I'm not ready to be a grandfather, then he's cool with him moving in with Brandy. I mean, you know, he, he <laughs> you know, there are some things that he does, you know, sometimes that's a little questionable, whatever, but he is, right, our Atticus Finch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He is. I mean, you know, and, and that's how I see Furious. I like the fact that some of my friends call me that, Furious style, and I take great pride in it. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, I mean, <laughs> so. <laughs> I actually like it. I was like, oh, you know, yeah, yeah. That should have been my Twitter handle. Yeah, you'll, yeah, you take that. <laughs> take that. I want to get a couple of questions from our audience. If we have any, if anybody has any questions, not necessarily questions, but just contributions. If anybody has anything they want to say to contribute to the discussion, uh, anybody got anything they'd like to sort of throw into this? Um, I, one thing I've noticed while we wait for people to kind of think up their questions is like, I mean, this is a studio movie. It's not it's not the most expensive movie ever made, but it's no. a decent budget movie. Six six, six million dollars. Million, six yeah. million dollars. Mm -hmm. um, that's a big thing to entrust a twenty four year old with. Yeah, who never made a movie before. Right. Never, not even really. I mean, maybe done a few little Super Eight films, but really had never done anything. How did he make that happen? So this ends up. So Singleton goes to you. You know, it was part of the USC's filmic writing program. Uh, it was a very prestigious program and won a few writing awards there and, and was really kind of thought very, very highly of. I mean, it's very interesting, too, that USC plays such a part of this, right, because he is from USC. But I don't know if you all, many of you know this, but USC is directly behind South Central Los mm -hmm. Angeles. I mean, they're, like, connected. And so much so that students are warned, like, at, you know, after night, you don't go over here. And, uh, you know, that's mm -hmm. how, you know, so it's, it's, like, literally in the backyard of, of South Central. So anyway, so so... You know, John goes there uh, and writes the script for Boys in the Hood. And, and what ends up happening also, too, is they had a screening of the movie Colors that Dennis Hopper directed with Sean Penn and Robert Duvall. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, John, outspoken as ever, because he was taught to be that way, uh, basically gets up and tells the, the, the people who, this is bullshit. And they're like, well, what do you mean? Like, he says, this is a movie that's supposed to be about my neighborhood. This is about two white cops. He says, and, and everybody that looks like me in the movie 
you know, is doing this dastardly stuff and it's terrible and he's, this is not good. And they like, he got, they, they say to him, well, Ice-T did the music. And he said, yeah, well, Ice-T didn't write the fucking script, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is what he tells him. And so he immediately at that moment says, well, okay, John Singleton just primarily sees himself as a storyteller. He was trained as a screenwriter. He started directing because, in his words, he didn't want some fool from Encino or Idaho directing some movie about his neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So he got into directing to protect his vision. Yeah. And so what really went to happen is he was when the when the script kind of hit the, you know, hit the market, so to speak, everybody wanted to buy the script, but he refused to sell it unless he directed it. Yeah. And many of the studio execs said they hadn't seen anybody with that kind of uh, moxie, as they say, since Steven Spielberg. Yeah. And that's how he, he that's how he got to do it. Yeah. Having a good script can protect you, you know. Yeah, it can. If, they, if they want the script, and you can, you can mm -hmm. sort of stand there. So that's a that's a great lesson for filmmakers: is yeah. write a really good script. And it's so want. narratively specific. Like, yeah, they knew, right? Yeah, that yeah, yeah. It, it, in Hollywood is the great forgetting engine because it, because they forget their lessons all the time. But people have always wanted. Um, audiences have always wanted great stories about people that you care about, mm -hmm. and that's that's always been the case. Mm -hmm. 120, yeah. 30 years, you know, that's always been the case. Um, but but they always seem to kind of forget that in a movie like this, right. which comes out for six million dollars and makes sixty or seventy million dollars, reminds them again and again, yeah. you know. And and you know, and the, and what ends up happening is that know, he 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 makes a movie. Two years after this, because he was criticized about kind of leaving the women's story out right, in Boy right. in the Hood, so he makes Poetic Justice as an answer to that. And which really, arguably, you can kind of say even that gets to be a little bit more about Tupac's character, Lucky, a little bit more than Justice in some ways, but still Justice, I mean, it's so groundbreaking what he does there because now, you know, like, you know, box braids and all that stuff that people weren't like coming about because Justice wore those in <laughs> Poetic Justice. And, you know, he, and, and you know, and what people don't understand and know about John Singleton as well, too, is how much of a cinephile he is. I mean, one of the things he thought about when he was making Poetic Justice, right, he thought about Sophia Loren and two women, uh -huh, right? Uh -huh. And so it's kind of thinking about kind of stripping Janet Jackson in that way where she was kind of fresh faced and kind of like, you know, round the way girl, sister from the hood, do this kind of thing, right? Uh -huh. And then, you know, Boys in the Hood, you know, he does Boys in the Hood, he does Poetic Justice, he does Baby Boy, but Poetic Justice and Baby Boy don't get the same uh, support, if you will, as Boys in the Hood does, because Boys in the Hood comes out at a time where people were like, unaware of what was going on in neighborhoods. Like it was certainly maybe unaware of turning a blind eye to it. They ignored it, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if you, you know, South Central lost, so it's Sunset Boulevard is here, and here's Hollywood, and then here's South Central. And these people are like, we had no idea this was going on, and you know, this happens to Ricky, and everybody is just torn up about it, and everybody like, loves this movie. And then Poetic Justice and Baby Boy comes out, and they go, oh, it's not the same. Oh, it's not, we don't like these as much, or they don't like, and it's so interesting now that John has died, that now everybody's talking about, you know, just how great poetic justice is or whatever. And I was like, where the hell were y'all in 93, right, 94, right. 95, 96? Right. You know, to, you know, talking about these films and, and and they and you know, and there's so many instances where John was ahead of his time. Like, you know, everybody is not Tulsa, you know, Tulsa Massacre. No, no, John made Rosewood long before nobody saw it. You know, so there were ways that he was, you know, that he was making these statements and saying these things, like you said, delivering these messages mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that no one paid attention to until, you know, you, you, I guess, you know, like Biggie said, you nobody until somebody kills you, right? It, when you die, yeah. that's when people realize how great you are. You know, so. there's, a, there's a fun story, I wanna get your comment in just a minute, there's a fun story that Miles Davis uh, was hanging out in New York and a guy walked up to him and he said, I love all your music up until the stuff you've been doing for the past couple of years. And Miles Davis goes, do you want me to wait for you? <laughs> you know? yeah. It's exactly like that, you know. It's like, well, yeah, no, you'll catch up later. I, I saw a hand right over here, yeah. So, you know, Officer uh, the Coffee, I think is his name in the film, uh, it is this kind of representation, right, of this kind of self-hatred amongst, uh, you know, black people. And here he is, not only he's a darker-skinned brother, right, and, and so that, ha that carries its 
own baggage, you know, in terms for him as, you know, already. But what it, it is this fine line, right, that when you are black and you work for the police department, right, and how do you police your own people, right? And, and some of these, and some people, right, uh, in their way of policing their own people, in order to kind of fit in the crowd, right? The blue line seems to be a lot stronger than the black line. And and so they end up being harder on the people, you know, on their own people than they are, you know, on they would, than would they would be on anybody else. And I think that's the reflection of that. And I think that happened a lot, right? It, it, or that happens a lot still too, but that certainly happened a lot then and this and particularly with gangs and everybody else and then the kind of mentality at the time right was we need to do something to get rid of these gangs i mean when we were even right around the time you know we start kind of having these discussions post you know well with sprinkler with with, with bush and and reagan and all them in the area and then you know nancy reagan kind of was really like going around south central los angeles and she was wearing SWAT jackets and they would have these brothers laid out on the ground and she would literally say like, these people cannot be rehabilitated and would say that on the news, right? And so this notion, right, of fitting in with that, uh, you know, in, in, in the midst of also saying, if y'all didn't act like this, then this kind of stuff wouldn't happen to you, right? And you know, and that, you know, that kind of uh, mentality of sorts, right? And, and it was just damaging all the way around. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, but there is a representation of that. And so, so that, Thank you. yeah. I see a hand right over here. Yeah, I'm curious, just in general, what's your, well, not what's your take, but uh, what's your opinion of like his run of like commercial films starting in 2000 with Shaft and all that? Because mm -hmm. I like a ton of them, and I love that he has like a cast different genre, and you know, talking about how like his favorite film and his one from that is Star Wars. Uh, mm -hmm. Um, of that 2000 batch, uh, I mean, I really like the Shaft remake a lot. I think it's more, I, th I think it's kind of true to the spirit of the original Shaft, right, that Gordon Parks does in, in you know, in the 70s. Uh, and so, you know, so I really, like, I love the fact that John, you know, John saw himself as a hip hop filmmaker, and, you know, and, and, and always found a way to find, to put a hip hop artist, you know, so Busta gets to be in, 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 in the Shaft remake or whatever else that happens. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you know, he, those commercial films, you know, were these, this kind of way where he gets to be this kind of director for hire in a sense, right? You know, these projects, maybe not necessarily anything, right, that he developed or wanted to do, but got to be a part of or whatever else. Uh, you know, I think that it became this way of kind of making sure that he kind of stayed uh, in the public eye or whatever else because his more personal projects were not being made. I mean. I think about like for years, right? You know, because John Singleton's a huge comic book guy. He was huge on that. I mean, he loved him, and wanted for years to make a Luke Cage film that never came about, never happened, right? Uh, and so, you know, him doing a film, or, or, or like, or even doing a movie like the, the 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 Fast and the Furious sequel, the second one, you know, for Too Fast, Too Furious, for him doing things like that, right? Uh, all of those things kind of point to right you know, that part of him as a young kid that liked going to the movies with his dad and seeing, you know, certain kinds of films. And, and so, yeah, I think that, you know, it, it's very much him yeah, to have made films, films like that. I mean, those all have such a great visual sensibility. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, and, and this is something that, you know, Singleton, you know, his visual stamp, so to speak, right, uh, grows after a while because, you know, I mean, there's nothing really distinctively visual about Boys in the Hood really, right? When we think about auteur theory and how, and, and, and a visual stamp and such, right? You know, but over the years, you see those kinds of things grow. But, but, um, but again, it's primarily, even toward, you know, the end of his life, John still saw himself as a storyteller, saw himself as, you know, a writer. And, but like I say, but that, uh, that visual stamp grew over, over time. And I think we certainly saw that in, 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 in the, his genre work, but I think specifically, you know, when he gets to Baby Boy oh, yeah. uh, in 2001. Yeah, we can really kind of see a lot of what happens there. They, they certainly write stylistically, uh, technically, uh, or technique-wise, right? He's matured at that point, visually, yeah. I, I, saw you, I see a hand way back here. Hi, Hello. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, I mean, my man Larry Fishburne had been doing it forever. I mean, I was just cornbread early me back in the 70s, right? Uh, and then, you know, lying to Coppola to get in uh, Apocalypse Now. Yeah, you know, he doing that. So, you know, Larry was seen, Lawrence, excuse me, was seen, uh, you know, you don't like Larry anymore. Uh, uh, Lawrence was seen as like, you know, the old, you know, the grand old man, so to speak, you know, everybody. And it, it was a case of John at the time before he even got to make a film, right? It was like going up to these people. He went to Q and was like, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna put you in a movie. And they were like, yeah, 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 yeah. Like we, we hear that all the time. And then when it came to fruition, like he went back and, and went after all of those people, right? And then for Regina King, I always love to see Regina King. I, I love Regina King, man, I love her. And, and see y'all, some of y'all just got on to Regina too. But 227, Regina, you know. Uh, but, uh, but Regina, you know, was trying to break out of that good girl, kind of 227-ish kind of, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, pigeonhole, so to speak. And I remember when I first saw and hearing her use the F word and saying, and saying nigga, and I was like, ooh, ooh, Regina doing that, you know. Uh, and then it just made, you know, and, but it was like we, when we start to kind of see that transition to her more mature roles, and John really kind of helped facilitate that, right? And then, of course, even with Poetic Justice, when she plays Aisha and that, right? And then, you know, but then these same kind of party of people kind of like move over and they go with Cube and they do Friday, you know, Nia and, and, and Regina and that as well, too. But, you know, but for Angela Bassett, right, who, again, right, you know, was still kind of not Angela Bassett yet, right? So it was this case of kind of taking a chance on John and really liking this script and really wanting to do these parts. And, you know, and Angela would before, uh, you know, John, Angela would be like in some John Sales movies like Passion Fish, right, which I'm teaching this week, and, <laughs> and some other stuff that would end up happening before she kind of hit with uh, what's love got to do with it, which kind of put her on the map. But again, but yeah, but John, you know, had the foresight to kind of recognize that talent, right? And to put these people in these movies, right? And, uh, you know, really becomes like one of the first people uh, to put rappers in movies like that. Like, you know, which, you know, later uh, actors and so whatever else, you know, you'd have that case where Sam Jackson would say, you know, I don't want to work with rappers. They're not really actors and stuff like that. But I mean, but Cube's performance, and this is electrifying, I think, right? And there was this talk at the time, like the Cube and, and would, might get an Oscar nomination, which of course that didn't happen, but certainly there was a huge talk that Larry, Lawrence Fishburne, would get one, and it, and it didn't happen. But the screenplay and, 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 and John's directing did get the nomination because people were so taken by the film. But yeah, I think, I'm, I'm so glad you bring that up because that's something I think he also needs to be, John Singleton needs to be, uh, heralded for is the way that he recognized talent and was able to do that so young. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. I see another hand right over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, you mentioned neorealism, right? And you think about things like De Sica's, you know, Bicycle Thieves, and you think about uh, uh, Rossellini's Rome Open City and things like that, right? And of course, one of the tenets of, or certainly characteristics of, of, of Italian neorealist filmmaking, right, is the use of non-actors for the purpose, right, of kind of uh, uh, making sure, right, that you, there's some form of realism put forth. And I think that's, you know, again, Singleton coming, you know, having this training, right, from USC. I mean, clearly, right, you know, he knows these films. 
and 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 really wants to kind of engage in that same authenticity because that's everything to this film, right? If we didn't, if it didn't come across realistically, then we wouldn't believe what we see, right? And so the the use of non actors, uh, the use of some of the gang members in the neighborhood, like they even went up to him and said, like, how the hell are you gonna come up in our neighborhood and film a movie and don't do, you know? He had to he had to negotiate with them, mm -hmm. right? Which in turn gave him a certain level of protection as well too. Uh, in, 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 in making the film as well. But all of those people end up popping up. But then some of the most endearing, to me, characters in this film are people who have never acted before and really haven't acted since. Like Monster, the one that's like, man, I'm on parole. I, this shit right, right. is like one of my favorite, big country. But I, man, we love, my friend Kevin and I quote, quote Monster all the time. Like, and, and you know, and, and then the guy, uh, Dedrick, the guy who plays, uh, Oh, she's the one with the, the pacifier, uh, you know, who ended up, you know, who's in poetic justice and then it actually ended up being killed. Uh, he's dead now. And uh, and uh, but again, but you know, again, but this the the. You know, it's not this kind of notion, in which, in which is very much so true of neorealist filmmaking, right? That it's not this kind of trained acting. It's them playing the part, doing it like, you know, basically in a lot of ways, like being themselves, uh, but it's so effective. And, it, and it's very much so performance, for sure. And so, yeah, I mean, I, that authenticity is everything. And John, you know, was clear to want to make sure that his neighborhood was represented a certain way. And that did mean using people in the neighborhood to kind of just, you know, pepper the background or to kind of use them in those very, very kind of small parts that end up in quite being, you know, really impactful, for real. And this is a good time for a message for filmmakers generally. So like when you want to produce a bold new vision like this, it really helps to go back and study what's been done before. It doesn't yeah. mean that you're um, repeating what's been done already. It means that mm -hmm. you're finding those tools for your bold new voice to mm -hmm. get out there. And so what he's, he was finding with neorealism and what he was finding with his influences were allowing him to have that bold new voice. Right, so, right. Uh, watching all these old movies that we show sometimes, you know, sometimes that's a <laughs> that's a key to helping you find your your bold new vision. So uh, Singleton certainly knew that, and it, it, it's amazing as he knew it so young. Yeah, I mean, and this is I think some of the benefit of you know him having gone to South, you know, go, going to USC. You know, I mean, there's a lot of talk all the time about right. Do you really have to go to film school to be a good filmmaker? But, but I think that's the stuff that ends up happening, right? If, they, if you don't go to film, you just you know, got your camera and you go do it yourself, that's all fine and good. But if you don't know to watch, you know, uh, or, or to screen Bicycle Thieves or to watch, you know, Jules and Jim or to watch Breathless, you know, or to watch a Kurosawa film, uh, if you don't know to do that, right, then there is these like chunks of your education, right, that you miss because if I think about the new Hollywood period, you know, from 67 to 82, where there's so many of those filmmakers, that's where their inspiration came from. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and Spike Lee, if you look at what Spike Lee does, right, Spike Lee, the work that he does, Barry Jenkins, the work that he does, I mean, these very much so have like a European sensibility. And these are people who, you know, I mean, you know, Jenkins talks about Claire Denis all the time, right? And so, you know, those films become this way, right, like you say, of presenting something fresh, presenting, some, presenting something bold, right? And, and it doesn't just have to be Hitchcock, you know? <laughs> and, and at this point, we look at John Singleton, and he's yeah. an old master, you know? Yeah, right. He's, an right. Old, he's one of the old masters that we study in school. Yeah, so. he is now. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, we just kind of look at Boys in the Hood. My goal with my book, right, is that we pay attention to his other works. Yeah. Uh, and, and certainly the other films in this trilogy, you know, this South Central trilogy that he does, which, which I think, you know, raise some very, very interesting questions about coming of age in, a, in, in, in you know, in, in a place like this, right? And, and still being in your 20s and trying to figure things out, which is what we happens with Justice and Lucky, and then what ends up happening with, you know, with, with Jody and Yvette and, and what have you, but this way, and, and, and then these young parents, <clears throat> mm -hmm. like Juanita and Baby Boy and, and Furious, who's like 34, right. right? You know, and they have these 17 year old kids, whatever, and then, and this way that they try to maneuver like uh, their own lives and then still be parents and whatever else, and then you're this close in age to your children. You know, I mean, all of this stuff is very real. Uh, these are very real dynamics, right? And, you know, some of what I got, what kind of happened to me writing about this initially, I remember going to a, uh, I'm a member of the Society of Cinema and Media Studies uh, uh, organization, and I went to a conference, 
and I remember, you know, you know, back in the back in the day, <laughs> uh, brothers coming up and asking me, more can these kind of scholarly academic brothers asking if writing about John Singleton, am I, is that really putting us in a situation where I'm presenting the best about black culture? And, and, and I wrote about that in, a, in an article uh, that I did for the Cinema Journal mm -hmm. about not removing the black from uh, black popular culture. And, you know, it sounds now because we're, you know, we're a little more aware than we used to be or whatever else, I, I guess. Uh, but, 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 you know, that kind of respectability politics and whatever else is real and it's something that black People do have to think about, and 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 you know, am, a, a, you know, uh, they already kind of think less of us. So should should I be doing this? Should I, you know, should I be writing about, you know, you know? I mean, I still get pushback when I teach Sweetback in class. I had a student accuse me of showing child pornography to, when I taught Sweetback. You know, so there's these ways, right, that these kind of things ends up happening. And I remember that when he said that to me, I was like, I really didn't have an answer for that because I'm going like, you know, there's no one way to be black. Right, but there, this is this, but this is black culture, mm -hmm. right? It's not the black culture, but it is a black culture, right? It, it, and 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 it deserves to be examined. It deserves to be discussed. It deserves to be seen. And you know, I remember thinking, well, okay, that kind of messing with my head a little bit, and going back to my dis my dissertation chair, and going like, well, maybe I should just write my dissertation on John Sales, like I want to do anyway, uh, which is my second choice. And even though I really wanted to write about John Singleton, and my chair said to me, he says, Mark, no matter what you write about, you're always gonna be the black scholar that does this. So write what you wanna write. And I said, okay, well then I did it. I'm writing about John Singleton, <laughs> which is what I wanted to do. So. <laughs> And I've been I've been lucky enough to to read a few chapters of this book, but most people haven't, and they want to read it. So what's the deal? When is this book coming out? Oh, so my <laughs> my deadline is Halloween. So uh, and I, I've 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 you know been blessed to have like one of my mentor in, in, in at Emory College at Emory University in Atlanta, uh, Dr. Bress Mishamadi. She's been pushing me. My dear friend Jennifer, Dr. Jennifer Wilkes, who teaches at UT. Uh, has been like, you know, we get together and she helps me with writing and with my writing and helps me like hash out ideas and and, and then I kind of, when, when I'm like going off the deep end, she just kind of looks at me <laughs> and like, it's almost like, how many times are we gonna talk about this? Like, you get it together, like, you know, write it and get it done. You know, and then and my friend Deshaun, who's like, write it and get it done. You know, everybody's like telling me to do that because I have, you know, I'm a perfectionist, and that's not a good mix with imposter syndrome and all this other stuff that ends up happening. <laughs> so you know, and so I'm, I'm pushing through it. But I, I mean, I'm I'm happy with it. I'm 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 proud of, of of what I've done so far, even though it sounds like I'm not. Uh, but I go through and read it, and I say, you know, this is actually pretty good. You know, but I think some of my biggest fear is is wanting to make John Singleton proud. Yeah, right. uh, because. Uh, outside of some articles about Boys in the Hood, where there's no work about John Singleton, this will be it. I'll be the one that has it. And so I want it to be good, and I want it to be a wonderful tribute to him because I, I truly believe in my heart of hearts. I, he deserves it. I love him, and yeah, I want that to come through in the work. Not to put pressure on you, but 40, 50 years from now, people are going to go and look for like that that primary work of John Singleton scholarship, and it's gonna be your book. So you better do a good job. I know I gotta do a good job. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we'll expect this by the end of the year, maybe. <laughs> and uh, and uh, at, at that point, we'll do it again, and we'll have a chance to show, because you've been talking about all the other John Singleton yeah. movies you wanna show, we'll have a chance to show those, and all these people will come back and watch the movie as well. Awesome. So I wanna thank you so much thank for you. joining us. It's been great, Mark. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was great. Thank <laughs> you.